Good evening. I'd like to thank IWP for allowing me to speak uh, once more. I gave a lecture back in February, if you guys want to go to their YouTube uh, channel and check that one out. Uh, that was involving the U.S. and China. But tonight, instead, we're going to be talking about the world post-Putin. As the Russian war in Ukraine continues, there are rumblings in the Kremlin that stuff might not be going super great. There's rumors about Vladimir Putin's health, about just the election coming up, and even that, well, somebody might be coming up afterwards. And the failed Prigozhin, Prigozhin rebellion showed that. As such, one needs to start thinking, well, who's going to come after Putin? He's been president of Russia for nearly a quarter of a century. Thus, it would be um, pragmatic for the United States to prepare for a world post-Putin. But before we talk about the world post-Putin, let's kind of look at Russia before Putin. So, in 1991, as some of you well are aware, the Soviet system more or less collapsed completely, and with it, its entire government. The Leviathan that had been around since the 1920s crumbled away, and a Frankenstein's monster of a political system came up afterwards. The men who more or less brought this monster to life were no longer the apparatchiks of the state, but now wealthy capitalists who had used their inner uh, connections and monetary means to essentially buy out what was the Russian industry. While the, average Russian, while the average Russian lost their job, they lost their welfare, and some of them even lost, lost their home. And this whole system was being held together by a maybe drunk premier who was battling a Chechen rebellion, a communist coup, and was still trying to ensure that, well, you know, the Soviet, now Russian sphere of influence was still there. The system was flawed by any stretch of the imagination, but it was more democratic than the system the Russians have now. Yeltsin and his family, his inner circle, had the task of building a functional state from a system that hadn't really had a state in a while other than the party. And as such, they had a very strong challenge ahead. However, the system realistically only lasted until Putin took power in 1999. If Yeltsin was the first president, and I'm going to use elected in air quotes here because nobody's really elected in Russia, if he was the first one to be elected, then Putin would probably be Russia's first Volsh, or like real strong leader. Now, Putin changed the system a lot. As you can see on the screen, this is a rough outline of what the Russian government's supposed to work as. The Federal Assembly is supposed to be more or less their congressional side. It's supposed to make the laws, etc. The president of Russia is supposed to execute those laws. And then you have two different courts, the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court handles criminal cases and the Constitutional Court handles constitutional cases. And this is how the system's supposed to work. But over his nearly quarter century in power, Putin has solidified a system solely around him and his cult of personality. Now, for us, some people might be alarmed if something like that were to happen here, obviously. But in Russia, not so much. As of the time of when I wrote this, Putin still has about an 80% approval rating, which is pretty dramatic. And that allowed him to push further and further and more reforms, like in 2020, when he pushed forward reforms that solidified his power as president. Now, in theory, it was supposed to, to devolve power, but in reality, it allowed him to run for two more terms after this one. Putin is admired by his people, as I mentioned, with his high approval rating. People, when they complain, they don't complain to themselves. They don't have a march or anything. They complain to Putin to fix the problem down below. Mm -hmm. And as such, he plays both mob boss and king. That's much like the Tsar. And so, <laughs> pretty much. And as such, he pretty much is feared by his enemies, but really loved by the people that adore him. But all this really kind of comes into effect when you start to realize, well, the man's 71. So there's two different ways Putin could be, well, deposed, for lack of a better term. First, well, as I mentioned, he's 71. He is mortal. And the average lifespan of a Russian male is about 65 to 67 years old. So he is well above what, is, what they consider, uh, you know, old. There's rumors being floated around that he has a terminal illness, anything from cancer to... Uh, brain tumors to Parkinson's. As you can see, this is the famous photo of him grasping the desk and not really knowing what was going on there. There also is the fact that, well, the Russian elites have had a trouble going upstairs, falling out of windows, drinking bad tea, etc. And that kind of leads into the second way he could lose power, would be a palace coup. For those that don't know, a palace coup is generally where people on the inside, well, get rid of the head of the state. And while that might seem unfathomable to us, it's not actually that 
far-fetched. There is a lot of discontent amongst the Russian elites that he's not going fur further enough in the war, that he's more or less holding back. And as such, Russia at the time of writing has lost it. Uh, between 230 to 280,000 men, both KIA and MIA, in the war thus far. And so, with that unhappiness, it's re led to a more hawkish wing of his party to really be discontent. The guy down there is Igor Yerkin, aka Strelkov, who is a leader of the more aggressive wing, as I should say, of the Russian faction. But Regardless of who comes next, there are three scenarios I could see playing out when Putin eventually either dies or gets deposed. The first of which is what I've aptly named the Gang of Four. I hope people can read the names on those. So this Gang of Four are the men that essentially run the internal security state of Russia. From left to right, it's Nikolai Patrushev, Alex Bortnikov, uh, Vladimir Kolotsev, and Sergei Narishk. Uh, yeah. And all of them being the heads of the internal state would actually be very well poised to take over. Russia actually has a precedent of having at least a troika or three members, in this case four members, take over the state before it eventually solidifies around one person. When Stalin died, it was the troika led by Khrushchev who eventually became premier. While these men probably wouldn't vie for the presidency, it's very likely that they would use Medved as a puppet. He's already played puppet once when he was quote unquote president uh, back in, I think it was 2008. And as such, he could play the dear friend of Vladimir Putin because everybody knows that they go hunting and fishing and ride horses shirtless together. So they, uh, he, could be, he could say, this is my dear friend, I'm so sorry he's dead, and really you know, ham up the Mark Anthony as you would to the death of Julius Caesar in this case. As such, these men would run the state with Medvedev in charge. This is the most likely scenario as it would secure power for the state and it would also secure the intergoings of Russia, at least for the time being. The second scenario is what I like to call the free-for-all. Now, this is assuming there's no coalition of people that come together and that literally everybody in Russia is vying for power, which is a likely possibility. Knowing who takes charge in that free-for-all is almost impossible to tell. However, there are some people to watch. Of note would be Viktor Zolotov and Dmitry Kochnev. Now, for those who don't know, Viktor Zolotov is in, tar in charge of the Roskvardia, aka the Russian National Guard. They are a very large force at 340,000 strong, and just recently were praised and beloved by Vladimir Putin for their stopping of the Prigozhin Rebellion. However, little they actually did. But for stopping the rebellion, they ended up giving heavy equipment, such as APCs and tanks, that were traded in by the Wagner mercenaries. People that would be close to Zolotov would have a massive, massive amount of military force to be used to secure the state. However, secondly is Dmitry Kochnev, who's in charge of the presidential protection of Russia. Now, he only has about, uh, well, what I found, about 50,000 men under his charge. There might be more, might be less. Obviously, that's a classified number. So. Something along 50,000. But he's also directly in charge of all diplomatic security, all the presidential security, and securing the Russian nuclear arsenal, should there be an, an event. Now, Dmitry Kochnev, unlike most people in the apparatus of the Russian state, actually, as far as I can tell, doesn't have any major direct ties to Vladimir Putin. If anything, he's more tied to Dmitry Medved, since his wife is a Medved. Now, the likelihood of two Medveds being in the same place, I feel as though you might have a better chance of winning the lottery. Uh, than them not being related. So that's the two men that need to be watched in the event of a complete and utter fallout of power because whoever is going to take over the state is going to need one of them to side with them. Zolotov is a diehard Putin loyalist, so it's hard to tell who exactly he would throw his dice in with. I highly doubt he would try to take over the state because he's not real well known and he doesn't have a whole lot of big personality out in Russia, but these would be the men to watch. The last and least likely scenario is Alexei Navalny. Now, Navalny being in charge of Russia in any degree would be astonishing. He has very little support, and what little support he does have is basically by the youth who have all fled Russia. He is hated by everybody in Moscow because of his party's strong anti-corruption stance, and he 
is currently locked in prison for another 19 years. So it, odds are not in his favor. However, uh, this is Russia, land of interesting opportunities and odd outcomes. So one could compare him to a, you know, a communist revolutionary who was exiled from Russia, brought back in by the Germans, and uh, subsequently started a whole revolution, all of Vladimir Lenin. So it could go one of those two ways. Regardless of who comes in power in Russia, the United States needs to change its policy. Firstly, the United States needs to change this policy of a dethaw. As you can see on the screen, this is the famous reset photo between uh, Hillary Clinton and Sergei Lavrov. It was supposed to reset relations between the United States and Russia. And every administration since Bush Jr. has tried this whole thing. They have tried to reset relations, dethaw relations, basically get everything back up and going. And that just doesn't work because the Russians don't see the United States as their friends. They will never see the United States as their friends. This is not a fun, hey, you know, we'll just get back and go better. So instead, the United States, instead of trying to re or trying to dethaw, should just keep playing hardball with the Russians and basically say, look, you are going to be a functional state in the international society, or we're going to keep on sanctions. We're going to keep on ensuring that you cannot do a whole lot outside of what little you can do in your own country. Along these same lines, the United States should not try to play the Russian Federation against China, regardless if there's Putin or if there's a new man in charge. The United States shouldn't do this. Russia and China don't want to be the United States' friend. Surprisingly enough, they don't really like us too much. And some believe that we could pry Russia away from their alliance with China. But as long as Russia remains the junior partner in a Sino-Moscow relation, there's no way Russia would A, want to join the United States, or B, China would let Russia go because they now have a constant supply of gas, albeit it's little, but a constant supply of gas. Lastly, the United States needs to remember that for all its issues and for all its worth, Russia will not be a liberal state. Russia can't exist outside of its imperial ambitions because that is how Russia has formed, that is its, its cultural zeitgeist, is force and power. That's how they exist as a massive state. They could be a liberal state possibly if the country were to be fractured and give up some of its territory, but the country exists by force, through force. And as such, the idea of trying to persuade Russia to give up that imperial dream or to play ball with other more Western states is just not really that, um, just not that likely to happen. So here are, some, here are some of the policies that I think the United States could move on. There were some of the people I think that might take hold. Um, I will take questions. It was kind of quick, but I'll take questions. Yeah. Uh, your figures for popularity. Yes, ma'am. Uh, where did you get that? Um, those were from... I think those were from a Pew Research poll done about a year ago. So nothing super recent, but still within a time frame that would be comparable to what it is now. Because if you notice, when Vladimir Putin or Dmitry Medved were in charge, whenever they started slipping in the polls, they start pulling off power plays. 2008, Putin annexes uh, uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia. 2014, Russia annexes Crimea. Both of those slingshot Putin's party and himself up into the high levels of Russian positive attitude. Like I said, they enjoyed the idea of being a super state and a powerful state at that because they feel a little bit left out after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Is there a reunification candidate, someone from the outside who could bring their part of Russia back into Russia? You mean like if they break up? Or, or part of the old Soviet Union, is it someone on the outside who would... Is there, do you have any scenarios on that? Where somebody comes back in? Well, they, they want Ukraine, is there another, you know, that's, that's, if someone can become the head of all of Russia by bringing the, the, the former... The no, because nobody wants to be part of the new Soviet Union. Surprisingly enough, nobody, the Ukrainians don't want to be part of it, the Kazakhs don't want to be part of it. People don't even want to be part of the CSTO at this point because it's shown that Russia can't defend its members. Russia is more or less a, turned into a pariah state of its formal international obligations. I mean, they're having to get ammo from North Korea. Of the demographics of Ukraine, is the Eastern third mostly Moscow Orthodox? Uh, I saw that it was like describing the Eastern part of 
Moscow Orthodox, the Western Greek Orthodox, and the Middle Labor Day see religious? Uh, I have not seen any current statistics, seeing as they're getting bombed right now. So uh, I would imagine a lot of them are just Orthodox, not really regarding which patriarchy they get into, because that turns into a, another political uh, nightmare when it comes to religious politics in that regard. So I don't really know what exactly the statistics would be on that one, but I would imagine that a lot of them are much more willing to follow the Ukrainian patriarchy as opposed to Moscow, because Moscow had a bad habit of putting KGB agents into their Orthodox churches. Any other questions? Uh, back there. Yeah, you. Uh, going back to scenario one, you mentioned the gang of four. Can you clarify more about why you chose these four particular agencies? I know you said they collectively control the state apparatus. Can you clarify, one, which what are the agencies in question and why they are the four most powerful? I guess it's a little hard to see back there, isn't it? Um, so Patrushev is actually the secretary of the Security Council. So he's got the allegedly not the second most powerful position, but in reality the most powerful, second most powerful position behind Putin on that. Alex Bortnikov is actually head of the FSB, so it's his job to basically make sure everything's going on internally well. Uh, Kolotsev is the Minister of Internal Affairs, so again, the, keeping all that internal apparatus together, because all these agencies, the FF, FSB, MVD, and SVR, all used to be the KGB. Now, they all got split up for obvious reasons because the KGB had a bad habit of, well, ensuring who they wanted in charge. So the re that's why I chose these men, because most likely these are the men that have some of the most power in Russia and even amongst the Siloviki, which are the Russian oligarchs. Well, they also have police. Well, they do it. Exactly. So these men would be most likely able to secure things. Now, people would say, what about the military apparatus, such as Gerasimov? That would be no problem for regardless of who, who takes charge because somebody needs a scapegoat for how bad the war's been going. And the military apparatus in Russia is that perfect scapegoat to say, look, you've killed a lot of our guys through your incompetency and a lot of corruption. So let's, uh, let's maybe get somebody new in charge. And it could be somebody that's a lot more aggressive because regardless of how this pans out, the next person in charge of Russia, uh, yeah, even with Navalny, will be either more hawkish or at the very least stop the war in Ukraine, freeze that conflict, reassess, and go back. And that's just kind of how that one goes. Next question. You. Uh, yeah. What about two other options, which by are more, uh, more uh, global? First is uh, uh, take over by uh, those modular bureaucrats uh, in the system, like Mishustin uh, Sadyanin, like according to the Russian Constitution, if something happens to Putin, then uh, Prime Minister takes In theory, yes, the Prime Minister yes, takes over. Uh, and the second option, the Russian. So I, uh, as to the first option, Mashustin, I actually thought he might be a power player, but the problem is, is Mashustin's almost a little too dovish, if that makes sense in Russian politics, from what I've researched. He would be, I think, better for Russia, but because of the want and need to just get the war done at this point. Russia and Ukraine have been fighting for a year and a half. You're going to have that more hawkish wing say, hey, guess what? We can come in. We can get this done. It might cost a couple of hundred thousand lives, but we'll get it done. We'll get what we want. Uh, Mashustin, however, I just don't think necessarily has the political pull because you are correct. Technically, if Putin were to be, you know, incapacitated or whatever, it does fall to the prime minister. But I think that could very quickly just kind of be tossed away, especially when you have these men in charge of the internal apparatus like it is. As to the collapse of Russia, that is a scenario that creates way too many variables. And so I would say if Russia collapses, it would be hopefully post this. So that way there at least is a little bit better of a soft landing. But as in my free for all scenario, it could just be that you have warlord states and the Federation falls apart. Because as I mentioned, Russia is held together by force. So I'm, I'm not going to say one way or the other with a collapse scenario, because that's, again, just too many variables at this point. So that's what I'll say on that. Yes, sir. So I think it's really but what are the chances of getting the whole recognized the war is bad and use the demise of Putin as like a kind of war or super recognizing that Russia 
Well, Russia has a bad habit of not ending wars. Uh, surprisingly enough, they are still technically supporting Transnistria, which is a separation region in uh, Moldova. They still support Abkhazia and Ossetia in Georgia, which are breakaway regions. They also are known for just kind of meddling in other people's affairs as it would be. Do I think that they would stop the war? Uh, yeah, they would freeze the conflict, at least on the current battle line, to create a much better defense and be able to push further. Because these guys, bottom line, are getting hurt at the end of the day. So a quick and swift war uh, would benefit them dramatically. You could even possibly see them draw Belarus in to the, ensure that they could take over most of the country and set up a puppet state. But I think they would temporarily freeze it, kind of wait for international stuff to get pulled away by something else, some other tragedy or something along those lines, and then go right back at it. Much like how Russia did in 2014, where they took Crimea, took parts of the Donbass, stopped, let that conflict freeze, waited for you know almost a decade, and then started something back up. Yes. In that scenario, though, like just kind of building off that, do you think that Ukrainians would accept a scenario like that, where they're not getting, you know, the full their full and serial, um, their their integrity of their, uh, uh, you know, the territorial integrity back? Sorry. <laughs> like, do you think they would accept that, or do you? No, do you not at all. I don't. I don't think. Western backing. Ukraine will not, even with or without Western backing, Ukraine would not accept any terms other other than their 1991 borders. That's That I have little doubt on. I think most people just want the war to end, but end of the day, it's not, you know, somebody's got to win, and this is Eastern Europe, so they're going to go until somebody collapses. Yes, ma'am. If the perceived risk of Russian reinvasion if it would, uh, cause the conflict and then decide to reinvade is so high, what do you think Ukraine's chances of fulfilling its EU candidacy within the timeline are? Do you think that's likely? Uh, probably not, because the EU is its own political animal with its own issues. You have the Germans and the French complaining about the Hungarians, who are also complaining about the Poles, who complain about everybody else. They have their own internal struggles. People think politics here is insane. The EU is something else. So whether or not they would actually get full candidate status or like actually join, I don't know. There is the possibility that worst case scenario, Russia takes everything up to, you know, what used to be West or what is Western Ukraine right now, leaves that as a rump state. It's possible that that could join the EU, but at that point, it would be more of an economic burden than it would be anything else than wouldn't bring anything to the table. Ukraine, under its 1991 borders, has some of the most valuable resources for Europe, so that's what they'd be shooting for. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so if there is. By the constitution, the prime minister takes over and he needs to organize elections. Yes. If that were to happen, what in what kind of Duma would come out of that in your estimation? Well, if that were to happen, if I was guessing and being very educated on that guess, uh, I would say that most likely you would see almost a almost a resurgence, not resurgence because they're already in charge, but the party that Putin's in, the um, not United, United Russia. United. Yes, I could definitely see them winning a majority of seats just because people would be like, oh my God, can't believe he's dead, can't believe he's not there. Because you have to remember, for a very large swath of Russian society, this man's been the only guy in charge of their country. He's led them through the second Chechen war, the cursed submarine disaster, many other disasters in their country. So, you know, a lot of people, at least very tepidly, I would say, and in, in like him as president, because he's the only one they have. It's, uh, when my grandmother, uh, when she was born, it was, she was born in 1932, and she always spoke very highly and rosy of FDR, because that was the only president she knew for her early adulthood. So, you know, she spoke highly of him, but she didn't really know anything else until somebody else, until I think Truman came in. So I'd say it, it'd be something along those lines where people would say, man, you know what? The party's really kind of with us. We're gonna go for it. And that's one reason I think Medved would be in charge because he does have that public face of the United Russia Party. I mean, he was president, at least kind of, of <laughs> Russia. So, he could say, look, I will run as president, even though technically you are correct, prime minister should be in charge, but Russian politics never go as their political system is supposed to go. I think just recently, um, I think it was Sergei Lavrov or one of the Russian ministers came out and said, oh yeah, we know that we won the election held next year. 
So, you know, it's, it's one of those systems where, yes, there's elections, yes, people might vote for new people, but will there be an actual change? Not until the people actually start making change on their own. What does that mean? Uh, internal movements, realistically. Like the Russian civilization, there are people that either left or are still there. They need to, I don't know, demonstrate, have protests. And I understand how challenging that is in a police state like Russia, but that's the only way that system's going to change. Well, it needs to be violent demonstrations, not just, not just cheering demonstrations. That's up for them to decide. I'm not I'm violent or peaceful. I, I think regardless, they would have to have demonstrations. Yes, ma'am. The gentleman that you said is in prison for these last 19 years, that seems to be more, I think you said more, his mindset seems to be a little more democratic. Is that correct? Uh, in theory. Okay, so then who's the second person in charge? Does he have one? So not really. Technically, Navalny's running as an independent, but he does have one other guy that, as far as I understand, still is technically in the Russian Duma. Um, whose name is escaping me and I did not write it down. I probably should have, but I cannot remember his name. It begins with an M, but Navalny is not really that much better. I mean, yeah, he's anti-Putin and yeah, he's anti-corruption, but when asked about the whole Crimea issue, he's like, oh yeah, well that belongs to us. And when asked about Russian kind of more power, I would see Navalny as a gloved fist rather than just an iron fist, more so than He'd be more soft power, trying to use Russia's capabilities, which are very good on that soft power field, but not really giving up that imperial dream. So remind me, who do you think would be the best replacement? Oh, I don't think there's really a good, I think this is a dilemma and not a problem. There's not, a problem has a solution, a dilemma has, well, okay issues with it. <laughs> so do I think that any of them are good afterwards? Not really, because all of them will, at the end of the day, you have the hawkish side, which is the gang of four. You have a free-for-all scenario, which, well, to be completely honest, that would just be a mess in and of itself. And then you have Navalny, who, while ostensibly might be a little bit more nice, to use lightly, he also, at the same point in time, still has those ambitions. Because, end of the day, Russia is an imperial state ruled by force. That's how they've existed. They've existed by expansion, not necessarily by bringing people in. So what, what, are his, what are his stated goals? Navalny? Yeah, they got him 19 years in prison. Uh, allegedly corruption. That's what they're charging him under. But the Russian Federation is really good at... What, what, what has he been advocating for that he has a following? Oh, he's just very anti-corruption, which a lot of the younger Russians see as an issue. But the problem is, is because he's anti-corruption, he's also kind of not exactly... Uh, the best friend of all the people. Like him and um, Zolotov there have had it out with each other for a while because he started investigating well, Zolotov. He's not the best friend of all the people. That's quite vague. So please elaborate. Like the Siloviki and the oligarch? Well, like the men in charge, the men in the Security Council, the Siloviki, the oligarchs that run the country. He's been trying to stop and get their corruption out of politics. The problem is he in of himself is actually kind of corrupt, not as corrupt as them but they don't want him to come in and start that process, obviously because they don't want to lose their money, but also because he's considered opposition to them. And so they just don't want him to come snooping around, if that makes sense. Uh, I've got a question over here and then I'll Going back a little bit to the demographics, but more a change from when the Ukraine war started. And now I know the Russian Orthodox leaders came out supporting Putin's move, like he was saving souls mm -hmm. of those of the Moscow Church in Ukraine, have they backed away from that the war is justified, the religious leaders? Not to my knowledge, no. They've, I mean, they've been blessing but missiles like it's got a style. He's going to hold him back a little bit if he's trying not to lose that relationship. I wasn't sure if that Who, was Vladimir Putin? Putin in Russia, in Ukraine, you said his leaders were complaining that he's like holding back. Holding back militarily. Right. But he's maybe afraid of losing the people who he supposedly is saving their souls. Well, there's a little bit of that, but there also runs the fact that Russia has elections in March. And another mobilization wave, A, could actually lead to more people leaving the country like the first one did, or B, actually start pulling people from the European side of Russia, which is a little bit more uh, not too 
uh, not as, I guess, ignorant of what's going on as opposed to the people that live all the way in Siberia. And so there runs the risk of that spiraling out of control. So that's why I think Putin's holding back considerably because I don't think he, I think he thought that, hey, this is going to be a three-day war. We got this over in the bag, quick done. You know, we took Crimea in like a day. You know, they took Georgia in, I think, a week. So, you know, going to be easy. Turns out, not so much. No, he wasn't alone in that. Well, the United States was wrong on that one. <laughs> yes, sir. How would you see the uh, impact of economics and maybe the impact of the data across the board and the sanction and the impact of sort of all the other stuff that play out as far as who is Along the economic lines, I'm not 100% sure because. None of the, the oligarchs have their spot in charge. Of the, like the head of Gazprom has his spot. The, like the head of Rocio, you know, Russia One is uh, Vladimir Putin's gymnast girlfriend. Uh, so I don't really know. Obviously, it would hurt their bottom line, and they would try to push for an end quicker because they kind of want to make money into the day. But as long as they can skim some off the top or be placated, I think that it would behoove them. But that kind of leads to the point of my uh, point about the United States. If there's a change in leadership in Russia, we can't just instantly say, hey, sanctions are up, you're not part of the international society now that you know, your former leader's done, because well, the oligarchs will eventually start feeling the pain of the money, as you know, they are feeling now. And so that could lead to more fracturing, more breakups, another coup, a centralization of power along one line or the other, because even a lot of the Mega corporations in Russia now are f filling their own private military companies to protect their assets, which, you know, if the whole structure falls down, well, you know, they at least will make sure that they keep on going. Does that answer your question, kind of? It does, yeah, I guess. The second part of that would, be, would you see them falling in line with, like, the game before, or would you see them maybe putting their hat in with someone that's more influential towards? I think Russians are pragmatic and they'll go with whoever really seems like they're going to help them the most. And so the Gang of Four being the more at least stable scenario out of all those and the most likely, they'll go and be like, hey, we'll be friends now. Because you got to remember, the men who are in that Gang of Four are on top of being in the Security Council are also Siloviki themselves. They have to make money somewhere. And so you know, it'd be like, hey, cool, you know what? You grease my palm, I grease your palm, we'll freeze a conflict, you can make some more money. Call it a day. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so you mentioned that instead of the U.S. resetting ties with Russia, you would suggest the U.S. to continue sanctioning Russia. Mm -hmm. Do you worry about Russia um, increasing like trade with North Korea, specifically weapons? No, not really, because there's only so much trade Russia can deal with either China or North Korea because the infrastructure just isn't there. Russia's economy was very geared towards the Europeans and their market. And as far as I understand, unless they built a new railway, the only way in or out of the Asia side of Russia to the European side of Russia is the Trans-Siberian Railway, which can only do so much. So I don't really, you're seeing this now, that China and North Korea can't really pick up the economic loss that Russia's been hit with on their European sectors. And as such, yeah, you know what? They may make a couple of bucks off of a North Korean artillery shell that might blow up halfway in transit. Mm -hmm. But that's a, I don't think it's going to be able to pick up their economy to any great extent because they just don't have the infrastructure there to shift east. Now, maybe 10, 5 years down, you know, 5, 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, they might have more infrastructure that way, seeing as the West not being a viable option, but that's a little far out. Any other questions? Comments, concerns? Yeah. Uh, concerning the chain of custody of the nuclear stockpile, would it be the gang of four that's somewhere that that's where the, I guess, the strategic missile command answers to? Or, it, so let me rephrase the question. Which of these scenarios would have the best chance of keeping that stockpile not being used? You know, so stability, uh, in, in other words, confidence of the chain of custody of the nuclear arsenal going forward. The best one you have going forward is probably the gang of four scenario, just because, you know, if Medved becomes president or is just like, hey, you know what, I want to be in charge, and the prime minister is like, cool, you know what, you do you, uh, then uh, Dimitri over there, Kochnin, 
he, he, he's the one kind of in charge of that. So he answers to the president of Russia. Now that very much enters a very odd scenario where the prime minister who becomes president ends up not becoming president and you know a weird chain of custody. But the gang of four is probably the most stable situation. In a free for all, you really do risk the breakup of the Russian Federation. And then uh, even in a Navalny scenario, they might not exactly be su super peachy keen on being like, hey, Navalny, we'll let you have access to some of the nukes. So, sure. and a follow up question to that is if the United States has to get involved in influencing an outcome for one of these scenarios, what should its calculus be when choosing the backup player if it needs to influence? Or it, should it just say, hands off, stay away, and why would that be? The case? It doesn't need to influence necessarily. Right. And tepidly, I would say that the only thing the United States needs to do is make sure that the nuclear arsenal like, stays in check because. Realistically, there's not a whole lot the United States could do to swing Russian public opinion one way or the other. There's, their society is so depoliticized. Like here, we might be hyper-politicized. You know, the left says one thing, the right has to say something else. So here, we're almost hyper-politicized. There, they're almost completely depoliticized. And some of that stems from the Soviet Union. Some of that stems from the fact that many of them just know that there's no real personal speak. Like people don't actually elect people to represent them. So. What's the point of getting involved? And some of it just kind of deals with, I'll deal with my problems. I have a lot of them right now. Why should I care about bigger problems? That's for the people that are higher up the food chain than me. So I don't think there would be a strong influence campaign. And you know, uh, several, what is that, like 40 years of a Cold War has not really helped anybody's persuasion one way or the other. I mean, if you talk to a lot of people who are, especially in their 50s, 60s right now, they still think, oh, hey, Russia's Soviet Union, you know, not really the best guys in the world. So I, I don't think there would be a strong influence campaign. If anything, the United States just needs to monitor the Russian nuclear arsenal just to make sure some of those don't go missing. But that would be about the best case scenario. Because if the United States does get involved, it would either be a catalyst to a collapse because people would start saying, hey, look who's interfering here. Or it could actually cause a major issue between the you know, the Russian Federation and the United States, because they'd say, look, they're influent they were part of this coup, they were part of the death, and just kind of shoehorn that into an anti-American uh, propaganda issue. But how, how, how can the United States prevent the nuclear arsenal or parts of it from not coming under the control of a bad actor? Uh, I guess just track it. That's that's honestly, I am not super well aware of how we track the Russian nuclear arsenal. That's a little bit above my pay grade. And so uh, I'd say honestly, just keep an eye on it, figure out what we know, what we don't know, and then track them and make sure. And if they do end up in rogue states, then you got to find them because at the end of the day, nobody wants a warhead going away. But this is also assuming that the Russian nuclear arsenal is as big as they claim it is or as usable as they claim it is because as can be seen in the war in Ukraine, their stockpiles, their weapons, et cetera. A lot was kind of sold off during that 23 years, especially in the 90s, like, you know, a while, 30 years ago. A lot was kind of sold off to different people under the guise of, yeah, we still totally have that in stock. And in reality, it's not in stock. It's in stock on paper. Yeah, but even, even if 10% of it is functional, um, that, that's enough for a bad actor to do, to do really bad things. Well, that's why I think the United States could also possibly um, involve China in that issue as well. Because at the end of the day, regardless of what people might think, we might not like the Chinese, Chinese might not like us, neither of them really like the Russians, but nobody wants a nuclear war. Like, it's, it's just an end game. Nobody wants that scenario. And as such, international actors would be more than willing to assist the tracking of that. I mean, if you look at the Budapest Memorandum in 1991 that Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal. That was formed by the Russian Federation, the United States, and England to all be like, hey, we don't need these going somewhere. We need to watch them. And you know, just literally a, a year prior, the United States and the Soviet Union were at each other's throats. So nuclear weapons surprisingly bring the international community together more so than they drive them apart because nobody wants some random dude with a nuke blowing something up. Yes, sir. You showed the Hillary picture with the button. Yes, sir. Supposedly, it didn't say what it meant to say. Mm -hmm. Did it put the actual meaning overcharged instead of reset or something? I believe so. I, I I can't necessarily remember the full history of it, but we meant it as a reset. They meant it as a hey, uh, you know, maybe that means we get the green light. Well, there's a, the other drama is in Tilton, 
the Clintons tried to have Bill Clinton return to the White House, and the Clintons never leave. He started playing president of the world. So with the Clintons, there's a drama that got defeated. But what the Clintons tried to do was Bill Clinton was supposed to come back on the world stage with her being president and sort of, sort of playing president of the world. So I don't know how Russia tells the history of what the Clintons tried to do, but a lot of that got defeated here. Okay. And the Clintons were up to shenanigans. Awesome. We'll do. Any, uh, yes, ma'am. I mean, if they return it to the 1991 borders and, you know, everything seems okay, I would say a gradual reset of sanctions, but it would have to be gradual because Russia has a nasty habit of saying one thing and then doing another. So uh, it would have to be gradual. I'd say, yeah, sure, cool. You get to, you know, if you say you leave all your troops, leave Crimea, leave the Donbass, you know, and give Ukraine its 1991 borders then sure, we might reconnect you back to SWIFT or something along those lines. But Russia would have to show progressively that, hey, we're not trying to invade anybody anymore. Yes, ma'am. As a follow-up question, if then the only reason that one of your predicted successes would freeze the conflict would be to go back in, does it make sense for the U.S. to lift sanctions, albeit gradually, if the prediction is that Ukraine is, to put it pessimistically, kind of, <laughs> well, in, in the scenario where they freeze it, the lines would stay where they are, right? There wouldn't be a regression of Russian troops back across the border. There wouldn't be a deoccupation of Crimea. But if that happens, then no, the United States should keep playing hardball and keep up the sanctions because it's, you know, Russia just kind of steamrolling everything. If you start giving up the sanctions, then they won't necessarily, you know, they'll start having money coming back through, they'll start having monetary gains, and that funds a war a lot quicker. If by some chance they rescind back to their border, yes, the United States could slowly give away sanctions, but at the same point in time, hopefully while that's going along, Ukraine would also become either at least a, uh, a part of NATO or a part of the EU, and at least have some defensive alliance with a greater power, or the Europeans or the Americans. Yes, sir. Um, Russia, I guess, had one functioning time factory at the beginning of the war, and now it has two. Uh, and, and now they've, they've learned how, how to make the, the, the modern optics for, for tanks. And, you know, the, big, the big question is can we ramp up our sanctions in a much more aggressive manner so that Russia does collapse uh, economically as opposed to? It's just going a little step by step. So that I mean, I would say go go whole hog. I mean, sanction it to oblivion, put it in a North Korea situation. But I'm not a politician, and I understand there has to be a little bit more tact with some of that stuff. Because if you incre if you just go from zero to a hundred, that doesn't exactly look as tactful as going from incrementals. We're, we're essentially at war. What, what, what's, why do we have to be tactful? Because we're not at war. Well, we're I mean, it's because you can't, there's two sides to that. A, you have to sell it publicly, and B, you have to sell it internationally. International sales are a little bit harder, especially when you say, hey, by the way, we're going to also hurt a lot of other economies by doing that. If you do it gradually, it not only allows people time to say, hey, maybe this is not the best idea, and it also can give a little bit of a warning light, like, hey, we're going to keep on moving this up if you don't stop. I saw it. Yes, ma'am. Um, so none of your scenario envision a you know social revolution. In yep. Well, as I mentioned to the previous question, the Russian society, the people that were the most politically involved were the young people. And a lot of them left during the first mobilization. A lot of them moved to Georgia, Turkey, Kazakhstan, et cetera. And so what few people actually would have been more mobile on that stage uh, left. And as such, the rest of the more middle-aged Russian society is just depoliticized. They don't, they're very apathetic to just anything going on. They don't care. They're, they're just, they exist. And it's, and a lot of that is a byproduct of the Soviet system. You have a lot of people who, for, I mean, politics didn't really matter to them because, well, I mean, it, they didn't really get to choose anything. So instead they just survived. And along those same lines, you're seeing a lot of Russians in that same general mindset of, well, 
you know, I'm just kind of surviving. Politics is for the politicians, not really my cup of tea. And some of that might just be a more of a cultural thing. It might be a little bit more of a zeitgeist type thing for their own society. But if there is something like a popular revolution, it would be, you would see different strings of multiple different ideologies coming, coming alive at that point because Russia has a monarchist movement. It has a very strong neo-national movement. It has communists and social communist liberal authoritarians and every mixture of every political ideology imaginable. And that's kind of one reason that the United Russia Party has been able to stay in charge is you have the communists as pseudo opposition, but then the rest of the political parties have either been banned, stopped, or thrown in prison due to being a possible threat to the regime. So you, you because what you saw at the beginning of the war were some protests, but it didn't go far enough to actually cause an issue because very quickly the police in Russia very quickly clamped those down, stopped it. You're going to prison. You're going to go do this, go do that. Oh, you said something bad, prison. So it's one of those scenarios where the young people that would be doing that aren't there. And the older people that just don't care or actually like the United Russia Party are there. And so it's just not really, there's nobody there to start said revolutionary ideas necessarily. One quick follow-up. Yep. Um, if Putin has to mobilize, again, mm -hmm. a large number, like several hundred thousand uh, combatants for Ukraine next spring, mm -hmm. and that he now has to rely on... Um, Western Russians. Mm -hmm. um, do you see this, you know, shifting? This may be fueling. It um, could be possible. A historical example would be in 1916, right, right before the revolution. Um, so historically, yes, but I, I'm not a hundred percent sure because I don't. I don't think he'll mobilize until after the March elections because it just politically wouldn't look good for him, regardless. Right, right. Well, even if he were to even if he were to mobilize, it's unknown right now what exactly people would feel because I yes, you would start pulling people from the European side of Russia, which makes it a much more, hey, this is actually a war type scenario. But I mean, Ukraine's been launching missiles at Russia for about the past four months and actually deep inside Russian territory. And a lot of Moscow citizens are like, oh man, that, that's kind of weird. It sucks. This building blew up yesterday and then just go on with their lives. So I would say that there's the possibility of especially uh, younger-ish to more middle-aged people becoming more involved in something in that regard. But again, their media is held so tightly together. You know, you and I can look up and figure out, for example, both sides of the uh, Hamas-Israel crisis right now, their war going on. We can figure out their political ideologies, you know, why both sides hate each other. In Russia, it's Here's why we think this happens, and it's just one opinion, and that's the opinion approved by the state. And so that's kind of how I see what would happen if there's a new mobilization. Because I heard recently they're trying to call up uh, 300,000 troops in their next, in their next round. That, that was one of the numbers I heard, yes, ma'am, was 300,000 in their next round of mobilization. So whether or not that would be successful, because the first mobilization numbers didn't work out super great. So... Who knows if the second one would as well. And that's and it could cause a second brain drain of people just being like, nah, I'm not I don't want to go fight for, you know, Russia in Ukraine and die for a lot of at, at what number do you estimate the brain brain master? Um, as far as I remember hearing seeing the estimates, it was somewhere north of a million of just younger <laughs> Russians fleeing. The ones that could too. And those are those are generally the middle class to upper class Russians who have the financial and social means to escape. Generally, it's the poorer village people that get stuck with the fighting. Yes, ma'am, um, and I'll get to you. Yeah. No, you first, then him. Uh, what success do you see in the U.S. continuing to sanction North Korea that you would suggest that the U.S. are or even Zelensky would be able to sanction North Korea to suggest that the U.S. should completely tolerate that sanction? Well, with North Korea, it's worked out fairly well. The only reason North Korea gets supplies is because of China, predominantly, or through their um, very, very uh, complicated uh, crypto and 
other ways they make money. They actually steal a lot of information from Sony and places like that and then resell it back to the companies. It's almost like a digital blackmail. And that's how they make a lot of their money. I'm not saying that the sanctions would totally, obviously Russia is a much larger country than North Korea, but as you can, as I'm sure you can see in the news sometimes, North Korea is not exactly a happy-go-lucky place. As far as I understand, they're still in the middle of a horrible famine, arguably worse than in the 90s. So are you advocating for like starting a famine for the Russian people? Because that's what I've seen happening in North Korea. I haven't seen the oligarchs of North Korea or the do I think there would be a famine? Like, I don't think sanctions would cause a famine like you would because they're two totally different states. North Korea doesn't have a whole lot of arable land. Russia has a lot of arable land and the whole, in theory, the dacha system or the backyard garden system that Russians uh, very much have can sustain a lot of people, surprisingly enough. So Russia would be able to like weather a full humanitarian crisis in food but economically is where you want to hurt them. You don't necessarily want to, you don't want to starve the people, but you also don't want the oligarchs to make money. And there's a fine line between those two, I would say. Yes, sir. So given the situation that Putin dies or is killed, whatever, mm -hmm. and I think that we, most people would agree that that's kind of the only situation in which the Russian state would, like, has the high possibility of collapsing, what gives it more possibility or less possibility to there being a breakup into regional ethnic states versus like the, the big four having you know legitimacy. Why would they have legitimacy? Versus well, they would have legitimacy through the fact that they would pop, like, so to my big four scenario, right, back here, these guys would run the state behind the scenes, right? Medved would be the guy in charge. He would be the guy giving out the photos, waving the hands, you know, all that fun stuff. He'd be the guy in charge. And, you know, again, he was president once, so people at least know him, you know, they know of him. He's fairly kind of liked, at least to an extent. And so they would trout him out as the end all be all. Oh my God, Putin's dead. Here's this dude who for a lot of people somewhat might think he, you know, he at one point was a successor as an idea, but it would be as to the Russian state collapse thing. I don't necessarily see that happening immediately. Could that happen six months, a year, you know, however long down the line, possibly. But if it breaks up, then it would be, that would be a geopolitical nightmare, to say the least, because you would have smaller ethnic states, you would have Siberia out on its own, you'd have the Caucasus in a religious, ethnic, and general hatred of each other war. Um, Russia would rescind to what I would call probably its core lands, mostly around uh, Muscovoy and Novgorod, or not Novgorod, uh, St. Petersburg, that's what it's called. Um, St. Petersburg, et cetera. And that would be kind of where a rump state would sit. But whether or not people want that scenario, that's a different question. Um, I mean, whether or not people want it, it might happen, so be prepared for it. But it's not really a, it adds too many variables into this necessarily if I start going into that, because I did initially add that in and I was like, this is getting like, I need string and thumbtacks and ways to follow it. Yeah. I think that those, those regional ethnic leaders, all the governors that have been appointed by Putin in those regions, would use the opportunity as a power grab, or would they, you know, secede to the... There's a possibility of that, but the, the, the struggle is that these men control the state internal apparatuses. So, oh man, well, Sergei over here really sounds like he doesn't want to be governor, or he might secede. Well, Sergei's car might get blown up or thrown out a window or something along those lines because these men are the eyes and ears of the internal Russian state. They know what's going to happen before it happens, in a sense. So, and with Prigozhin and his poo, 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 coup, sorry, out of the way, uh, it's, it doesn't, he had the strongest independent military in Russia. And so outside of him, there wasn't really anybody else because I actually had to rewrite this because he died while I was. Like typing this down, I was like, well, there goes half my speech right now. <laughs> so, yes, back there. Yep. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you think would be uh, the role of uh, those new information provided by the Russians, by the old Ukraine side, or for the Ukraine, like Russian military or freedom of, of, of Russian region, let's say, the battalion uh, in the uh, battalion, in the case of uh, Russia's own collapse? In the case of the Russia collapse, or it's just its military, its military front collapse, 
I would see those men still working very highly and well with the Ukrainian government. And then subsequently after Ukraine is saying, hey, we can kind of handle this on our own or, hey, you can go just you know, like cause a lot of issues in Russia. That'd be awesome. I could see Ukraine using them in almost a sabotage style role in that regard, because end of the day, they're not and they're not exactly great people either. Like there's not really a. I know some of the Volunteer Corps, especially the Russian Volunteer Corps, has been known to having more uh, nationalistic, fascistic kind of views, at least with some of them. And so, you know, at the end of the day, you could toss them into the Russian Federation and cause a lot of problems. Do I think that they would become like minor warlords or something? Possibly in the event of a total collapse, but that would be a little bit too far the rabbit hole as, as I could get. Uh, I'm gonna go back and then we're gonna circle front. So you first. Can you comment on any sort of definitive trend concerning partisan activities internal in Russia right now, maybe among ethnic republics or within the Russian army proper? Or would you say that the security apparatus has it pretty locked down? The security apparatus, at least on a news and information side, has it locked down because I wasn't able to find a whole lot. There have been some ethnic, not conflicts, but some ethnic, you know, protests and stuff like that out towards Siberia. But their ethnicities are generally too small, too, dis too dispersed to be able to actually pull up a united front. And so you can kind of divide and conquer real easily in that regard. So that's, that's kind of what I would see for you know, in, in that case. And the state could definitely, in, especially with these guys, could kind of quash any rebellions before it happens. Okay, you ma'am, and then I'll get to you and then you. So do you see a role for Kedorov? Kedorov. After the Chechen leader? After oh, uh, well, I mean, Kedorov's in it for Kedorov, to be completely honest. He's kind of, I think, honestly, in this case or scenario, they'll probably just pay him slightly more than whatever he's getting currently paid or just increase his title, maybe give him a new general star or whatever. Uh, I think he'd be loyal to whoever's going to pay his check because as far as I understand, there is a large uh, Chechen movement outside of Chechnya and a little bit in Chechnya that is like, hey, we're not exactly the biggest fan of you because your dad kind of betrayed Chechnya. So... I think he's secure as long as they want him to be secure, but as soon as his time is done being done, uh, he'll he'll either find a car bomb or a bad cup of tea in that regard. Yes? Um, so does your thesis account for, like, I think you mentioned at the beginning the sort of, you know, potential fates, per se, for Putin. Um, does it account for any of the, uh, like, if he, he's kind of gradually, you know, not, not so with it, and then he endorses a successor, would that change the variables here, or do you still think it would kind of go to the gang of four in that s situation? Or I think it would change the free-for-all scenario, for certain, because you would actually have a kind of line of secession. But to be completely honest, if I asked anybody in 1999 if this pencil pusher from Berlin is going to become the new president of Russia, I can guarantee most analysts would say, who? So... I mean, yes, in that regard, it could be literally anybody. I mean, it, it, it's up to the, to, the, you know, to the successor at that point. But I don't... Honor it, honor it, though? Mm, it depends on who it is. Uh, I don't... But see, here's the thing. I don't think Putin's going to do that. The man has centralized power around himself for 23 years. And when you have that much centralized power and you kind of have a big ego, those two kind of go hand in hand to not really wanting to give up that power. Even if he recognizes that he's like he's dying, so for the sake of legacy. Like yeah, probably because it you know better to die as are than to give up your crown. You know everybody remembers Nicholas II. So, mm -hmm. yep. Last question. Russian culture. Who would have the? Who would be the, the most Hollywood? Like the ties to the vodka, the ties to the culture, getting the literature out. If if, if Russians love their poetry and they love their vodka, who after their hangover is their idea of Russia? If Putin was the Marlboro man as a vodka man, not not Yeltsin being in excess, but I would honestly give them a more Hollywood. I'd say Medved. I mean, his rhetoric just within the past couple of months has been very much been geared towards that kind of more base United Russia type front, and. Again, he's known to the people. They've seen photos with him and Putin, you know, riding shirtless, fishing, etc. What does that mean in Russian? That's his last name. I know, but what does it mean is something? It I've, sounds like doctors. I, I have. Don't know that you want it to sound mm -hmm. like Dr. Trump or Bear. Or Bear. Bear? Yeah. 
I did not look into the history of his last name, so I not hundred percent sure on that one, but I'll take your word for it. I think that is all I got time for for questions, and so I'm gonna introduce her back up. Thank you for having me.